Jill, let's give the high schoolers a big hand again. That's You know, I work, uh, as many of you know, I work at the college, so uh, the transition, is, it's quite the transition, it's exciting, whether they're going into school or whether they're going into the workforce, so it's a, it's a pretty cool time in their lives, so definitely a big congratulations to them. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to raise this up, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not going stool like, a Jewel, or like a Drew today because i, I got to admit my back is out, so i got to keep moving. i got to stay loose up here, so I'm going to stand... Uh, the entire time today, I know you're used to uh, Drew up here on a stool, but we're, we're going to be upright today, um, <laughs> just, to, just to stay loose. I may not get up off the stool if I sit down. That's the problem. <laughs> so uh, anyway, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tyler Hayes. Um, my wife and I have been going to Compass for, uh, man, over 10 years, basically how long we've been married. We've been going here a long time. Um, I've actually basically grew up in Bend. I, did, I wasn't born here, but I've been... Uh, living in Bend since I was a year old, basically. So I'm one of those Bendites. I left for college, came back. Um, somebody always, somebody passed on the wisdom of, hey, if you come back to Bend to get a job, you'll never leave. And I'm starting to believe that's pretty true. This place is amazing. We love this community. We love Bend. Um, my wife and I love this church. Um, I've said it before. We, we love what God's doing here, and we, we're excited about um, where God's going with this church as well. And, and I'm just excited to be up here with you um, today. Anybody else here? Question for Anybody else enjoying this uh, lovely June weather over the weekend? <laughs> yeah? Anybody else? So, so my son started playing, look, look, he's in the back there. He started playing baseball for the first time, first team sport this year. And it, I'll tell you what, what it did is it reminded me of how miserable spring sports are in Bend, Oregon. <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember growing up and, you know, it, it was cold and every practice this year we've gone to, it's been, you know, winter jackets hat, gloves, and it's, and it's funny because yesterday he had the last game and it came full circle, right? Um, I had to get my winter jacket back out and go sit and watch another baseball game. It was a lot of fun, but it reminds me of spring sports in Central Oregon. You just never know. But I think there's light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's going to be nice uh, this upcoming week. And on that topic, today is going to be all about sports. I'm excited. You can probably tell I'm excited. I love sports. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about sports today. Uh, for those of you who aren't that into sports, I still think there's a lot that you're going to be able to get from this message. I hope there's a lot that you're going to be able to get from this message. I'm a sports guy. I grew up constantly playing sports. My dad was a basketball coach. I, it's just something that I, I grew up around, and, and, uh, and I'm excited about today's message. And we're actually going to be camped out in four verses today. We're going to really just unpack four verses today, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, and if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn there now, or if you're using your phones, whatever you're using, I, want, I would like you to go ahead and join me there. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to be in verses 24 through 27. And I'll give you a minute to get there. It's in the New Testament. We're getting some feedback there a little bit. It's in the New Testament, um, and if you flip to the right, you'll, you'll see the uh, Gospels and then run into to 1 Corinthians. And the title of the message today, as, as you see up on the screen there, is All Out, All Game, All Season. Um, very sporty, right? And, and um, I, I think you'll get an idea of why, why we've got this title here as we, as we move forward. Um, but I want to set the scene for you. I want to set the scene for where we're at in 1 Corinthians, what's actually happening here, what's going on. Um, before we just dive in, I want to give you just a little bit of the context um, to what's happening. Um, so we've got this, this book, 1 Corinthians, and this is, a, this is a letter that the Apostle Paul has written to the church in Corinth. Many of us know Apostle Paul, right? He, he once was Saul. Um, through his, through his um, turnaround, his, his God working in his life, his name changed to Paul. He was once a guy that was um, out to murder Christians and then again did a complete 180. God did a complete 180 in his life, turned his life around and, and was one of those guys that just spread the gospel. Um, all over. So we love Paul for that. Again, he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. And the, the reason, really what triggered this letter, Paul had spent a lot of time in Corinth. He had, he had preached the gospel in Corinth. And um, you can read that in Acts. And he was there for a good period of time. Uh, but God, God um, used him in Corinth. Are we still getting feedback? A little bit? Yes. I might. I might switch here. Check. Can we turn this one on?
Is there a power button I'm missing? We're good? We're there? All right. There we go. That's a little bit better. I'll just use the mic. Um, so again, so Paul, Paul got triggered to write this letter um, to the church in Corinth because he had gotten word back from the church that there were some problems. There were some things going on in the church. There was a lack of discipline, a lack of self-control. Um, and, and Paul had gotten this word back, and he obviously had a heart for these people, and so he wrote this letter. So that's just a little of the background for you on, on the, the, for the letter to, the, to uh, the church in Corinth. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the city. So Corinth is, and I've got a map up here that you can take a look at. Corinth is about 50 miles or so from Athens. And the thing about Corinth is sport was huge. Sports in Corinth were huge. They had what were called the Ishmian Games in Corinth. And really, they were only second to the Olympics. And the Olympics were held in Athens. So just 50 miles away were these Ishmian Games that were held every two years. The Olympics were held every four years in Athens. So sport was a big deal. We, they were passionate about their sports. The culture, a lot of it was centered around sports. Does it sound familiar to our culture today? A lot of people are, are involved in sports. We, we love our, our sports and we're emotional about it. Um, and that was the same for the, church, for the city of Corinth as well. And they had arenas that held about 20,000 people back then for these games. Another slide here for you just to give you an idea. I had to do it. My wife's from Missoula, Montana. So you, gotta, you get a University of Montana. This just gives you a little side by side. But I will tell you, that, is, that stadium does hold about 20,000 people. So hopefully that gives you just a little bit of a picture and an idea of how big sports were in Corinth in these Ishmian games that were held there. And the picture on the left kind of gives you an idea of what the the stadium might look like. We've had a few upgrades over the years, I would say. The stadiums are much nicer. Um, but that gives you just a picture of what that looks like. And, and what I love about Paul is he loves sports. And again, he knew these people. He knew that they liked sports. So when he's writing this letter, when he's trying to convey this message from God, he's obviously trying to connect with them on some level. And he knew that they love sports. And what I want to do today, just to get started, I'm going to show a video. I just want to get the juices flowing, just get you awake. There is a purpose to this video, but I also just want us to get excited about what we're going into. And to me, again, I'm a basketball guy. We're not going to talk about basketball again this whole sermon, I promise. But March Madness it paints one of the best pictures of the emotion and the excitement around sports. So I just want to show you this video. The ball is tipped, and there you are. You're running for your life. You're a shooting star, and all the years, no one knows just how hard you worked. But now it shows. Fisher Davis right to the court. No good. And Northwestern has won. Wisconsin, they have knocked out the defending national champions. The two seed Duke Blue Devils are out. The time is short, and the road is long. In the beginning of an hour, this is an opportunity for growth, and you have to use it as such. The coach is son and dad with a smile. Brilliance in full display. Fox, you joined his chance to show what he can do against Lonzo Ball. Feel the beat of your heart, feel the wind in your Devoured by Bell. It's more than a contest, it's more. Ah, Joe Walter. Chioza. Oh, my goodness. That young lady's going to be on the internet all night. She's smiling. Monk to tie it. Oh, an impossible shot. Made for the win. North Carolina. Major Huggins. You always hit your face. Cause inside you know. Williams goes. And one. Gonzaga is going to be playing for the national championship. 
Ramirez going to go baseline. Loader. That? that was about? amazing. North Carolina for the national championship. The confetti is going to fall for North Carolina. They're not going to be denied this time. Tell me that gets you excited. Just a little bit. We ready now? We're awake. I love those videos. I tell you, my son and I watched it. How many times, Loke? We watched it probably 10 times yet in the last few days. Yeah, yeah. And then he's downstairs playing all, all night. Um, but that's it. I mean, that's, the, that's what we're setting the stage for in, in today's message, the emotion, the excitement around sports. And, and the, back in Corinthians, when, when, uh, in Corinth, that was the same way for them. They were excited about their sports, excited about um, their athletes. And and that's what we're going to dive into here to this morning. And in our verses, we're going to jump into verse 24 to get started. And in our verses, Paul is going to start out by using two sports analogies in these four verses that we're going to go through today. He's going to, we're going to start with the analogy of running. And then the second part of this, uh, the analogy, is going to be boxing. So those of you who didn't uh, think boxing was biblical, it's biblical. We've got it in here. So we're going to talk about running and boxing. And I've and uh, let's dive right into verse 24. I'll go ahead and read it for you. It'll be up on the screen as well. It says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Many of your versions may say run in such a way to obtain it as well. So how many people are track people? How many people like running? Show of hands. A few of you. There we go. We got, we got some. I know Collins, track coach at Mountain View. Uh, he's into it. He was a track guy cross-country. I've got to start by telling you that nothing I say today is speaking from experience when it comes to running, okay? There's a running joke in the Hayes family that we have what's called Hayes speed, and really what that means is the lack thereof. We, we don't have any of it. There was not a gene passed down to us. Actually, my mom always makes fun of my dad and I that, um, that we operate in one gear, but I will argue I do have a second gear, and I'll use it on occasion, um, but we, we are not the quickest people on the face of the earth. Um, so I don't have any experience in, in running, but we are going to talk about that first analogy of running here today. And, and so what, what are we really talking about here? I think we can all agree in the first part of this verse, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Pretty obvious, right? In a race, everybody's running, but only one person actually does get the prize. I think we can, we can all agree that that's pretty obvious there. The second part of this verse, though, this is the part of the verse I think we need to take a quick look at says, run in such a way so that you may get the prize or that you may obtain it. So what they're ta what's Paul talking about here? So he's saying, just like an athlete, we want to run the race to win. That's what he's saying. He said, in our Christian life, in our Christian walk with God, we want to run the race to win. And we all know there's a difference, right? We know that there's, there's some people, there's athletes, there's people out there that, that um, they just join the race. They just join the race and they, and they just show up. But they're not necessarily there to win. There is a difference between athletes who want to win and athletes that don't want to win. Would you all agree? There, there is a distinct difference there. And what God is trying to tell us here is he wants us in this race to win. And, and he wants us to have the mentality to be in the race to win. And I think when, one thing we don't uh, want to pass over here is that running is an individual sport. Running is an individual sport. And I don't want to miss that because what do we know about individual sports? For the most part, we know that the success, the motivation to succeed, typically lies on who? The individual, right? Typically lies on the individual. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna discount that individual sports, in individual sports there aren't support, there's, not, there's coaches, there's people who help, but for the most part, when we talk about individual sports, the success and the motivation to succeed lies on the individual. And that's what, and that's what Paul's talking about here. Paul is talking about, hey, we, we all get the opportunity to run the race. We all have the opportunity to run. But at the same time, we're all stewards. Each and every one of us are stewards in how we run that race and how we finish that race. And that's the important part of this verse that I don't want us to miss. I think we got it up there on the next slide here. So I'll say that again. I think it's important to remember that we all have the opportunity to run. We're all in the race. As, as believers, as Christians, we are in the race. But we, have, we can either just show up 
can just be there, or we have the opportunity to be stewards. We are the ones who have the opportunity to be stewards of actually how we run and how we finish. And I want to jump into uh, verse 25 here because you might be saying, okay, great. We know we want to run the race to win. That's great. We, that's, I get that. Um, you know, maybe that's a good reminder for me. Hey, I, I, got, I got to get out of just showing up, and I've got to start having the mentality of running to finish well, running to win. Well, it's great because God never leaves us hanging. Let's go into verse 25 here, and I'll go ahead and read that one for you. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Some of your versions may, see, may say exercise self-control. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And so, as Paul's writing this letter to the church of Corinth, again, we've got these athletes that are in these Ishmian games. It's a big part of their culture, a big part of their lives. Um, these Roman athletes, they actually had to train for 10 months before they even were given the opportunity to partake in these games. So they had to train for a long time. And we all know athletes, right? We all know, some of us know that how hard it, it, it is to um, train as an athlete, the effort and the struggle and the pain that goes into it. Um, and I could talk to you about that, but I found one more video. It's the last video, but it's a really good one. There's a lot of good videos on sports. I want to show you this video, and I want you to just think about what it looks like. Just think about what it looks like to go into strict training as an athlete. Let's go ahead and watch this. Rise and shine. 6 a.m. and your hand can't make it to the alarm clock before the voices in your head start telling you that it's too early, too dark, and too cold to get out of bed. Aching muscles lie still in rebellion, pretending not to hear your brain commanding them to move. A legion of voices are shouting their unanimous permission for you to hit the snooze button and go back to dreamland. But you didn't ask their opinion. The voice you've chosen to listen to is one of defiance. A voice that says there was a reason you set that alarm in the first place. So sit up, put your feet on the floor, and don't look back because we've got work to do. Welcome to the grind. For what is each day but a series of conflicts between the right way and the easy way? 10,000 streams fan out like a river delta before you, each one promising the path of least resistance. Thing is, you're headed upstream. And when you make that choice, when you decide to turn your back on what's comfortable and safe and what some would call common sense, well, that's day one. From there, it only gets tougher. So just make sure this is something you want because the easy way out will always be there, ready to wash you away. All you have to do is pick up your feet. But you aren't going to, are you? With each step comes the decision to take another. You're on your way now, but this is no time to dwell on how far you've come. You're in a fight against an opponent you can't see, but oh, you can feel him on your heels, can't you? Feel him breathing down your neck. You know what that is? That's you. Your fears, your doubts, and insecurities all lined up like a firing squad, ready to shoot you out of the sky. But don't lose heart. While they're not easily defeated, they are far from invincible. Remember, this is the grind, the battle royale between you and your mind, your body and the devil on your shoulder who's telling you that this is just a game. This is just a waste of time. Your opponents are stronger than you. Drown out the voice of uncertainty with the sound of your own heartbeat. Burn away your self-doubt with a fire lit beneath you. Remember what we're fighting for and never forget that momentum is a cruel mistress. She can turn on a dime with the smallest mistake. She is ever searching for the weak place in your armor, that one tiny thing you forgot to prepare for. So as long as the devil is hiding the details, the question remains, is that all you got? Are you sure? And when the answer is yes, when you've done all you can to prepare yourself for battle, then it's time to go forth and boldly face your enemy, the enemy within. Only now you must take that fight into the open, into hostile territory. You're a lion in a field of lions, all hunting the same elusive prey with a desperate starvation that says victory is the only thing that can keep you alive. So believe that voice that says you can run a little faster and you can throw a little harder and that for you, the laws of physics are merely a suggestion. Luck is the last dying wish of those who want to believe that winning can happen by accident. Sweat, on the other hand, is for those who know it's a choice. So decide now, because destiny waits for no man. And when your time comes and a thousand different voices are trying to tell you you're not ready for it, listen instead to that lone voice of dissent. The one that says you are ready, you are prepared, it's all up to you now. So rise and shine. 
Good stuff, right? Yeah, but think, think about that. You watch that video, you see the training, the work, the pain, the effort, the, the getting up, the alarms, all of that. That's what these athletes are doing to train themselves to win. And what Paul's saying here is, just like that in our Christian life, how much more should we be doing that to train ourselves for our walk with God, to finish well in our walk with God? And the second part of this verse really gives us a good, a good hint into why, into why. It says, they do, not do it, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So think about that. These athletes, these athletes on this video, the Roman athletes that we talk about in the Ishmian games, Literally, the Roman athletes in the Ishmael games, they would train for 10 months like we talked about. They would put, them, put themselves through crazy strict training, pain, everything that goes along with trying to win. And you know what they would get? They'd get a headband made out of leaves. Literally. <laughs> That's what they would get. But that, and, and that was their goal. That's what they were wanting to do. But it's a crown that won't last. Obviously, our athletes today, right? Yeah, they make a lot of money, but their goal is to get the trophy. And a lot of times they're getting a trophy that they don't even get to put in their house. And, and I, I think you can all agree with me that I can't even remember who won the Super Bowl two, three years ago, you know? So it, it's, these are things that will not last, but look at how hard they're training and how much effort they're putting into it. Again, what Paul is saying here is we are getting a crown that will last forever. We get a crown in heaven with our, our Savior that will last forever. How much more should we be training like these athletes who want to win, to run this race to finish well. That's what they're referring to um, in this verse. And really, I think it's key to also think about, regardless of our life stage, we're all still in the race, right? High schoolers, we, got, we talked about, we were celebrating the high schoolers today. They're going off to college. Okay? They're going to have a lot of things, a lot of reasons to step out of the race or just to get up in the morning and join the race instead of run the race to, to win it. I know as, as a, a married couple with kids, when you have kids, those of you who have kids can, can attest to this, it's sometimes easy when you have kids and family to get really busy and you start to lose track of what you're training for, what we're actually here for, and, and, and how we're training to finish well. Those of you who are retired, we talk about going into retirement mode, right? Some people talk about that. Yes, you've earned um, retirement, you've earned um, being able to do a lot of things for yourself, but at the same time, you still have a race to run. You still, have a, you still have a race that you need to finish well. And I think that's really the important part of the message in this verse. Um, and we'll slide right in here to the last two verses, verses 26 and 27. I'll go ahead and read those. Therefore, do not run like someone running aimlessly. And here's where we transition into more of the boxing analogy. So that's, that's the tail end of our running analogy here. So therefore, do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself, may be disqual I, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So let's start with the first part of this. I think it's important when we're, we see the word therefore, we've got to remember what we, just, what we just read. And what we just read was, but we, do, we get a crown that will last forever. So we get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, what Paul is saying do not run like somebody running aimlessly. Do not box like a boxer beating the air. So really, what's he trying to say here? He's trying to say that knowing what's on the line, knowing what we have on the line, knowing what the reward that we have in front of us, knowing that we want to take as many people with us to heaven as we possibly can in this race that we're running, knowing what we have on the line, we have to stay focused. We have to have a strategy in what we do. We can't just get up in the morning to run the race. And, I, and I was, it was interesting, I, I, I don't know anything about boxing either. There's a few sports I don't know much about. Running is one of them, boxing is another, but it was cool because I got to do a little research on boxing and learn a little bit about it. And uh, where's Andrew at? Andrew's in the house, he, he's, he would like boxing. I should actually just bring him up here and let him talk about this analogy. But boxing, boxers who actually throw a punch and just hit air. So a boxer that throws a big punch and they miss their opponent, that actually takes more energy from them than actually striking their opponent. And then at the same time, when they miss, they're actually opening themselves up to be hit by their opponent. And, and how true is that in our life, right? Does anybody else feel like you get up in the morning? I've had mornings where I get up and I'm just like, man, 
I, I just got to get in the race today. Like, I, I mean, I'm just, try, I'm just trying to run the race throughout the day. And my day, I feel like I'm going around just throwing huge haymakers and missing every single time. I'm not connecting on anything. And at the same time, I'm getting hits back in, in my day. And then I end the day, and I'm just exhausted, right? Anybody else feel like that? Anybody else had those days? We've had those moments, right? Um, what, what, what he's saying is there, we have to. We can't. We have to be focused. We have to have a strategy each and every morning we get up. We have to be focused and have a strategy on how we're going to train, how we're going to run that race today to finish well, to win. We, we have to have that mentality each and every day because there's a battle every day. I think we can all attest to the fact that every single day we get up, there is a battle in front of us. And, and if we're just out there to run, there's a good chance that we're going to be throwing punches that are going to miss and we're going to be hit back a lot and it's going to be, it's going to be a painful day. Um, I want to read Hebrews 12, 1 for you. I'll just go ahead and read it. It'll be up on the, the screen for you. But I think this really correlates directly to what we're talking about. I really love this verse. I'll actually read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance in the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand throne of God. What a great verse, right? What a great couple of verses. And what I really want to focus in on is that fixing our eyes on Jesus part. If we want to run the race well, if we want to finish well, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And look at who we're fixing our eyes on. We're fixing our eyes on the, on the Jesus, the Jesus that ran this race, he ran this race. He endured everything we could possibly ever endure in the race, and he died on the cross, and then he conquered it. And we have that same hope in him, which is the cool part. We know the, we know the end of our race. We know what the victory is for us, but he wants us to run the race to win it and then finish well. And to do that, we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Each and every morning, each and every day, all day, through prayer, through reading the Bible, through being a part of a core group, we talk about that a lot at Compass, we have to set ourselves up in a position to be focused on Jesus if we want to finish the race well. And I want to jump into um, the, the second part of that verse um, where it talks about, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified. So what, what's he talking about there? He's not literally talking about beating himself up, okay? I don't want anybody to leave here, give themselves a black eye. No, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. Metaphorically, though, what he is talking about is just like an athlete, just like a Roman athlete, just like our athletes today, we have to subject our bodies to the pain, sometimes the pain, sometimes the suffering, to serving God, to, to the ministry, just like an athlete has to. You can't go out and just run a marathon, right? They have to subject their bodies to the training, to building up their bodies to be prepared for that race. And just like in the Christian life, we have to subject our bodies to serving God, subject our bodies to um, the daily battles that we have so that we build that strength so that whatever God, whatever God has prepared for us, we are ready for it. And the second, the last part of that verse, I just want to touch on it just real quickly. Um, the last part where it talks about being disqualified. I want to make it really clear that this is, a, this is actually a moral warning. This is not by any means a teaching on a believer's security in Jesus. It's, it's not what they're talking about here. What he's literally summing up here in these verses is, if we don't do these things in verses 24 through 27, we're not going to finish the race well. If we don't go into strict training, if we aren't motivated by the prize that we have in front of us, if we don't train like an athlete who wants to win, we aren't going to finish the race well. And I want to conclude today. Um, I found a great illustration that I think really sums this up, sums up what we're talking about today. And, and then I want to talk a little bit about what this looks like going into summer. We're almost to summer, right? We only have a week left. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to close out today. But to close, I want to give you an illustration of something I came across. Again, a sport that I have no knowledge about, but it is so cool. It's called skeleton sledding or sliding. Have anybody, anybody heard about this? The Olympic sport? Have you, yeah, you heard about it? Basically bobsledding, but putting yourself going head first down that bobsledding hill by yourself. Sounds terrible. Sounds like a terrible idea to me. But I've got a picture up here of what that, there we go. Can we actually go back one slide? 
There's not one slide. Oh, that's all right. We'll use that one. Um, but this is what it looks like. You still get a little bit of an image of what this looks like here. And I want to read. I, there was an article in the New York Times. And again, I think this will kind of sum up and summarize what we're talking about today. Here's what it says. The spectacle of human bodies on an ice track hurtling headfirst at speeds of up to 90 miles per hour can make skeleton unsettling enough merely to watch. For athletes, it's even more extreme. Each of the three phases of a run comes with its own punishing demand. So here's phase one, the start. Athletes push their sled frantically for about 50 meters and then leap aboard for the descent. It's their one chance to generate velocity before gravity takes over. One of the athletes said, our engine is our push at the start. The straightaways, that's the second phase. Unlike a bobsled, a skeleton sled has no steering mechanism. It's just a metal frame covered with carbon fiber runners. To change direction, athletes shift their body with their knees and shoulders, altering the center of gravity and flexing the board slightly. One of the athletes said this, there are even times when I just use my eyes. That, that tiny movement can alter the posture enough to steer. The athlete then went on to say, where you look, you go. The turns, and I don't know if we have the image of the, do we have that next image? Got it, he's already got it up there for me. There's, there's somebody going around a turn. So the turns, corners are where skeleton racing is the most physically brutal. A tight turn can produce G-forces or pressure of up to five times normal. For perspective on that, consider that an astronaut lifting off in a rocket experiences about three G-forces. They're experiencing five. We compare it to a contact sport, one of the athletes said. Part of the challenge is how quickly the pressure hits. In a few milliseconds, your head suddenly feels as heavy as a bowling ball, and keeping it upright and away from the ice is a struggle. When you go right through a corner with four to five Gs of pressure, it's instantaneous. People smack their faces on the ice, concussions happen, the shoulders too are beaten up as they hit the ice. Sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> right? No, thank you. I will not be doing that. But what, what a great way to conclude what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians. I, I, again, I want to conclude with this. Think about this in, in regards to this. This track, this race that these, that these uh, skeleton athletes are running on, some of you here today may be just at the start, right? Some of you may be here, you're new, we're happy to have you here, you're just trying to check out this whole Jesus thing, trying to figure out who God is, what this relationship with God's all about, and some of you are at the start and you just need, you just need to get the, get the engine going, you just need to get the race started, right? And some of us today are here, we're on the straightaways, Hey, we've been doing this, we're on the straightaways, and, and for, for us, that key part, did you hear what, they, what one of those athletes said in here? Where you look, you go. How powerful is that? We just talked about in Hebrews 12 that we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. If we go back, can you go back one slide? Take, just take a look at those eyes right there. I mean, that's how intense we need to be when it comes to looking at Jesus. That intense, because any slight movement for them throws them off track right? They can crash, they can hit the wall, whatever it may be. So we might be on a straightaway, but we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We can't get comfortable when we're on our straightaways. We have to stay intense. We have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, because what's coming next? The turn, right? The turn, which in the Christian life, the turn may be the pain, the struggle. They talked about it right here. It's the most physically brutal part of the race for a skeleton athlete. For the, us in our, in our walk with God, it may be a death in the family. It may be a disease. It may be a loss of job. It may be relationships. It could be a whole number of things, and the turn is coming. It's not a matter of if it's coming. It's, it is coming. And that's why on those straightaways, we have to be running that race to finish well. We have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. So when that turn does come, we're not flying up into the wall. We're not crashing around that corner. We have to be ready so that we can get through that and strengthen our faith through it, because we know God works through all things, right? God works through all those things in our lives, those difficult times, and we want to finish well. We, again, we want to bring as many people with us. We want to fill up the bus um, as we finish out our race in, in this life. Um, and so, again, I just want to, I want to close with one challenge for you today. I hope you take away 
um, one challenge today. Again, going into summer, I was thinking about this. You know, kids get out of school. Those of you who don't have kids, you might have grandkids. You might be done with work. Some of you, some of you have to keep working. Um, I have a wife who's a teacher. I'm jealous every single summer. She's off. Um, but some of, what happens in the summer, we have some fun, right? Which we should. We go camping. We go on trips. And we do a lot of fun things. But what we can't do, and what this scripture is talking about, what we can't do this summer, my challenge for us this summer is, let's, let's make sure we're going all in, all, every day, all summer, training and exercise like an athlete that wants to win. This summer, make that your goal. Because it's so easy in the summer. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time sometimes in the summer. My routine's thrown off. Again, we're having a lot of fun. We're going on vacations. You know, I gotta, I gotta pack my Bible when I go camping. I gotta, I gotta remember that I gotta continue the race. I gotta continue to train, even though we're going into a fun period of time of a summer where we're gonna be outside enjoying Central Oregon, right? It's a beautiful place to be. But I hope all of us will have that drive to train like an athlete and to keep that training going even as we go into summer. Amen? Amen.